After 301 days, our long national nightmare is over. The Michigan Wolverines have won a college football game. Details next. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it, Nick Cook. This is no time for that. In the pocket and a sack. Tim Jamison. Brady gets terrific. Throws it, and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got it. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler to five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On its way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. Win it. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. Greetings, Go Blue. Welcome to this week's edition of Michigan Podcast. I'm Steve Dace. My partner at Wolverine Digest, Michael Spath from WTKA and Ann Arbor will be joining us a little bit later on in the program. But we begin by looking back at something that has taken too long to accomplish around here, and that is Michigan winning a college football game. Now, everything I say for the next few minutes comes with this disclaimer. Do not forget my suggestion of last week. And I'm I'm going to hold on to that. And that suggestion was make them, the team, the program, make them show us they are worthy of long-term prognostications like, you know, can we win the Big Ten if we do this? Or if this team loses here? Or let's W and L the schedule? Or, or buying into the hype? Or sipping the Kool-Aid? That's off the table. Not being served here doesn't mean I wasn't very happy with the way the team played on Saturday against Western Michigan, because I was, and we'll have more about that here in a few moments. But I just want to make sure, because I'm I'm already starting to see, and I get it, you know, fan is short for fanatic. But some of you, you know, they showed you a little leg. Some of you are like, I think meat's back on the menu, boys. Don't do it yet. Don't do it. Hey, this is a really talented team. A lot of these guys are going to have their names called in this year's and the following year's NFL draft. But it's not about being talented and it's not about routing undermanned undermanned opponents. In the Harbaugh era, we have beaten 22 unranked opponents by an average of over 26 points per game. All right. Even last year. When the, when the offense was two words, brew, toll, even last year, Michigan only won one game by less than 16 points. So, you know, we have recruited well. Um, we have a strong program. Uh, the comparisons between Brady Hoke and Jim Harbaugh because of similar records. Those of us who have been here for every game understand that's just a hot take. This is a totally different program. It's not even close. And that's exactly why my expectations are higher. So, you know, I cheered the Michigan team on. 
all throughout the 49-3 win over Western Michigan. I was hoping for the shutout at the end. I greatly enjoyed myself. I liked everything that I saw for the most part. Uh, I thought everything looked better than it did against Notre Dame. And it looked the way it should look if you are really talented playing a lesser foe. Uh, we just dominated on both sides of the line of scrimmage, over 300 yards rushing, for example. Uh, you know, Karan Higdon had the highest first half rushing total by a Wolverine since Denard Robinson against Notre Dame. That's going back eight years. You know, Chris Evans is apparently still on the roster, so that's cool. You know, I mean, he was lighting it up as well. We saw True Wilson get in there and run through some gaping holes from the second team offensive line. Uh, Shea Patterson made a couple of throws, including that touchdown pass to Donovan Peoples Jones. I mean, those are the best throws I've seen a guy in a winged helmet make since uh, Chad Henney was here. And then, you know, the defense, even down two starters on the defensive front, just absolutely owned this game. Uh, and, and that's what I was the most impressed with because Western Michigan has some weapons on offense and, and you know, lit up. And Syracuse isn't great, but they are a power five program and they lit them up for over 500 yards in the previous week. So uh, there, everything here is to like. We have the second straight week that, um, you know, the special teams had a big play, this time a punt block. You know, I was reaching for my good, the bad, and bottom line column this week at Wolverine Digest. I was reaching to find something bad and all I could really come up with was Quinn Nordeen in the field goal unit, you know, having the yips for the second week in a row. If that's the worst you have going on, you'll take it, right? So there's a lot to like about this. But it's not about going eight and four. It's about competing for championships. I, I'm not even saying winning them. You know, we don't have shared championships like the Michigan team could could share a title back in, in 2004 with Iowa, which is the last Big Ten championship we can claim. We don't have shared championships anymore. This league is as deep uh, and the coaching and the recruiting and development as good from stem to stern as maybe I can ever remember. You know, there was a time period in the late 90s um, and the early 2000s. Uh, there was a time period in the in the mid 80s where the league could come close to this level of depth, but this is as good and deep as I can remember the Big Ten Conference being. I mean, not even Urban Meyer in Ohio State, with all the talent that they acquire every year, wins the Big Ten Championship every year. So it's not even about winning them, but can you compete for them? Can you put yourself in position? Will you be the team this time that makes the plays that the other guys don't make and not make the mistakes that the other guys do make in the big games? Because that's kind of been the MO here in the Harbaugh era. We are the guys in the big, in the big games. We make the big mistake. The other team makes the big play. That's what I'm in this for. Uh, and, and until they show us evidence by beating a good team on the road that – um, th th that means that means they're capable of, of competing for championships. To me, I, I don't feel any differently after beating Western Michigan than I did after losing to Notre Dame because, not because I, I don't think this is a good team, but because I do. I think it has a lot of talent and a lot of potential to be really good, but I'm tired of predicting things and, and hoping for things and rooting for potential. I'm looking for productivity. So you have to show me. And they, they showed well against Western Michigan, but it was also just Western Michigan. We get asked quite a bit here on Michigan Podcast, what can we do to support you guys? Well, here's one of the big ways you can support what we do. If you if you like how we finger roll here on Michigan Podcast each week, support us on Patreon. Several of you watching us uh, each week here on YouTube do that already. Thank you very much. And if you support us just $5 a month, you get access to exclusive comment or content, including my commentary on instant reaction after every Michigan uh, football game, including including last Saturday night, uh, Notre Dame versus Michigan. I recorded that at 1 a.m. You get my, my football picks each and every week as well. So you do get, we give you some stuff we don't offer everybody else as a thank you to those of you that support us every single month here on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Michigan podcast, patreon.com slash Michigan podcast. Thank you and go blue to those of you that are supporting us already. 
All right, back here on Michigan Podcast and uh, my partner from Wolverine Digest and also uh, the morning host at WTK or mid-morning host at WTK and Ann Arbor joining us now as he does each week, Michael Spath. And we're back with uh, a special guest as well, uh, Danny Rogers, who was here with us last week. Good to see both of you. How are you? We're doing, we're doing good. And after such uh, beautiful responses uh, last week when Danny joined us as an impromptu, I thought we'd bring her back because uh, you know, we need a little more color on this show, Steve. And, and frankly, I mean, we had more traction last week than we did uh, at any point in probably the last year and a half. So um, if it's not broke, don't, you know, don't fix it. And so I <laughs> thought we should bring Danny back. We do need more color, man. I'm so white that I like leave that, that yeah, red spot on your screen. Okay, so we did need some more color. I agree with that. So, Danny, were you on? I know you were down on the field for the Notre Dame game. Were you similarly there for the big house for the Western game on Saturday? Yep, sure was. What, when you were down on the field, compared to what you saw from the team in terms of the way it came out, preparation, energy, or anything, any of that stand out differently to you from what you saw against Western compared to Notre Dame the week before? Yeah, I would say pregame, it, you couldn't tell that the Notre Dame, or that the Wolverines lost to Notre Dame in week one. You couldn't see any of that. They were all they were all running around. They, they looked energized. They looked really excited, to be honest. Um, and then during the game, I mean, when players are doing what they're supposed to do, tight ends are catching balls, um, the running backs, I mean, you're getting it to Higdon and, and Evans more than two or three times. Um, yeah, it's going to look a lot different um, on the sideline. So all the guys were pumped. Um, after every touchdown, there was a great celebration and there were a lot of touchdowns. So it looked completely different um, than the Notre Dame game. I will say that Michigan Stadium was – pretty quiet but like we said earlier in the show on wtka yeah it was western michigan so it's going to be a little it's going to be a little quieter but it was a little too quiet i would say she doesn't have our extensive experience with michigan stadium yes. 22 years old and she you know she's she's expecting it to be you know sounding like notre dame in a night game i told her i'm like yeah. danny like it's western michigan noon the students are barely there uh give us a break here wait till we play no Wisconsin doubt. in a couple of weeks you're not you're not a real michigan fan until somebody 79 years old has told you to sit down in the middle <laughs> of the game that that's your rite of passage at the big house danny that's yet to happen but stick around uh it will that's why i kind of laughed when sean callahan over at uh, husker illustrated was he was he was ecstatic yesterday when the nebraska michigan game was announced at noon instead of a night game and i tweeted him like sean I've been a Michigan fan for 35 years. There's no there. The, Michigan fans collectively loathe anything of any inconvenience. Night games. They would play every game at noon. Okay, so this is not like oh, I'd rather play LSU at two o'clock than at seven o'clock at night. It, not that's not kind of like that really at all. One more thing for you, Danny, from being on the field, because I'm, you know, my whole monologue to start the show today was slow your roll. It's Western Michigan. And, you know, um, you, it's a nice win, but, you know, that's not, you know, that's not, you know, start uh, having delusions of grandeur here. Debbie you, Downer. I, I'm not a Debbie Downer, man. I'm just keeping it real, yo, as the kids say today. Yeah, uh, so, never, ever do that again, Steve. <laughs> never, ever do that again. <laughs> You know what's funny is that's what my kids say to me all the time now. Dad, don't do that again. I hear that almost every day. Almost every day. You know, almost every day. But that's what happens when you have middle age and a five head. Anyway, back to you, Danny. Um, did you get the sense that physically it was JV versus the varsity when you looked at the two teams out there on the field? When you compare any team's defensive line to the defensive line that Michigan faced at Notre Dame, yeah, it's going to look a little JV-ish compared, compared to that team. But, like, you can't take away the fact that players were making catches. Sure. Offensive line, they were opening those huge gaps, especially for Evans and Higdon to run through. I mean, they were doing things that they were supposed to do, and if they did those things, like catch a ball in the end zone at Notre Dame, I think, yeah, they would have had a much better chance. So I I think this is a really good sign that guys are doing what they're supposed to do. Um yeah, SMU is coming up next, and it's going to be kind of similar to Western. But if, if guys keep doing what they're doing, what they're supposed to do all season long, the team's going to be competitive, and that's not overhyping it. You know, Steve, go ahead, Michael. You're talking about slow your roll a little bit and whatever else you've said that I don't want to even repeat. Uh, <laughs> when you talk about Western Michigan, we had this, I had this conversation with Devin Gardner you know, on our, on our show on Monday. Is like, what do you do with – 
with a game where the opponent is physically, skill-wise, talent-wise, inferior to your team. And how do you, what do you take out of it? He said, what you take out of it is confidence because your team needs to have those those, those successful game reps mm-hmm. uh, that don't be like, okay, now the, the play's in the end zone, the ball's going up there. Now I know what it's like to come down with that play, um, which they didn't have against Notre Dame. Uh, it also comes down with, yeah, you're beating up on someone uh, and maybe it's a little bit easier to move the defensive end for Western Michigan is to move the defensive end for Notre Dame. But you're learning, like, this is what it looks like. And so that's what the value of these games against Western, against SMU are, is you can at least see on film, okay, I got to I gotta probably be stronger, I got to be tougher, I got I to gotta work harder when I'm playing against Nebraska or Wisconsin down the road. But if I do, this is the technique I use against these guys like they did against Western Michigan, I'm going to have success if I'm playing with a little more greater urgency and strength in those games. I think those are good points. And, you know, and, and for folks who haven't listened yet, Devin is really good, uh, which shouldn't surprise anybody you followed his career, how well-spoken he was, how uh, articulate, eloquent he was, intelligent. Uh, but he's really good on the air. Uh, and when Devin played, they weren't blowing out Akron and UConn. We remember that, right? So I, when I'm trying to figure out, and it's not, it's even not just Michigan-related, Michael, but looking at the Big Ten, you know, we our conference, we play a lot of these MAC teams this time of year. And, you know, Northern Illinois, North Northern Illinois was everybody's preseason MAC favorite. They've played Iowa and Utah, and in those two games combined, have one offensive touchdown. Uh, you know, Ohio was everybody else's uh, MAC favorite. They were losing to Howard into the third quarter at home, week one. And so I'm trying to figure out if it's an overall down year for the MAC or really impressive, um, you know, performances by you know Western Michigan was kind of considered fourth or fifth best team in the MAC. Northern Illinois was the favorite, and Iowa and Michigan have just dominated. Dominated them, and so I'm trying to figure out if, if that speaks well for the Big Ten, or maybe we should collectively just see that maybe this is a down year in the MAC. But either way, you're right; it looked the way it was supposed to look. But I, I don't doubt that at all. I know we all know this is a really talented team. What what I think we need to see is that our guys aren't the ones with the bad holding penalty on the screen pass that would have beat Ohio State. Our guys don't drop the punt. Our guys get the first down at the end of the game to run out the clock to win a big game. I mean, these are all the plays we've not made, that, and everybody else has made all those plays in all of those big games. And that, to me, that's what I need to see because we have recruited well. That hot take about this is the same record that Brady Hoke had. For those of us that watched every one of those games, it's not even close to this program. These teams would destroy Brady Hoke's teams. Okay, so it's not even close to that. But it's a, for me, it's about competing for championships, and that's why that's where I'm kind of like, let's you know, let, let's not to go right back to the maize and blue Kool Aid all over again. So maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I don't know. I want to be wrong. I want to be. I, I want to win. Yeah, I'm, I'm there with you. I'm not. I'm not drinking any maize and blue Kool Aid. I mean, we were talking about it on our on our show on uh, Tuesday. Uh, that as bad as Michigan State looked uh, out on the West Coast there against Arizona State that I would still pick Michigan State to beat Michigan when they play in October because it's a road game and it's a big game. And until Michigan shows to me that they can win those, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go out there and say that they're going to win those games. At the same time, as someone said to me, well, you know, sure they beat Western Michigan 49-3, to but if you want me to be impressed, wait till they beat a big team. And I said, well, they, 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 they only played Western Michigan on Saturday. They, they don't get to control who they play in week two. And they're playing SMU this weekend. They can't beat, they can't beat Notre Dame last week and they can't beat Notre Dame this week and they can't beat Michigan State this week and they can't beat Wisconsin this week. All they can beat is the team that's in front of them on their schedule and that was Western Michigan in week two. It's SMU this weekend and then when you're playing in this game it, if, if you look at it for what you know those big games in the, the championship moments, if you don't if you waste this opportunity then you're never going to have a chance to beat uh, Michigan State or Wisconsin down the road. If you use this opportunity to develop depth, if you use this opportunity to develop that confidence, develop those game reps with some of the, the guys competing for spots with Brad Hawkins, Oliver Martin now who's seen in two games, maybe with James Hudson down the road, getting the confidence of Dylan McCaffrey in a back of roles so if he's needed uh, for Shea Patterson at any point, he can go in there. I mean, you can only do with what you've got, and what you've got is an opportunity against SMU to make the most of it uh, and to gain confidence, gain those important game reps. And so, yeah, no one's expecting Michigan fans to go giddy over a 35-point a win over the Mustangs this weekend. But if you see some positive signs, 
that's all you can really hope for, and that would be a, that would be a good step forward for this Michigan football team. So let's let's continue down that theme, Michael. As you broke down the film of this game, what did you see that that or did you see things that you thought, okay, here's improvements in terms of of craftsmanship and technique that project well as we go further into the schedule as opposed to this is the difference between blocking Notre Dame and blocking Western Michigan if you understand the distinction I'm trying to draw well I'll tell you what the biggest thing that I noticed in this game was how the coaches learned from the Notre Dame game and I say that because uh, I've mentioned this a couple times and you can read it on WolverineDigest.com uh, is that they rolled out a lot more in this game than they did against Notre Dame mm-hmm. I think that was a 100 percent a compensation for the fact that they don't trust their tackle still to protect Shea Patterson inside the pocket. Uh, out of the 20 dropbacks that two quarterbacks had on Saturday, seven of them were either naked bootlegs to the right or to the left. Uh, that is that is more than one-third of the time that they're getting out, outside the pocket. Now, part of that is because Shea Patterson is also good at throwing on the run, and as Devin Gardner said, when you do that, you confuse a defense because now the defense doesn't know what like how they, they fit in their assignments when all of a sudden the guy is rolling out and he's not where he's supposed to be. Um, but I thought that was probably the biggest takeaway I had from the Western Michigan game. In terms of technique, you know, I thought that uh, you know, John Runyon Jr. looked a little bit better against stunts. Uh, I thought that the, the, the passing game was a little crisper. I thought the tight ends did a really good job blocking, which I did not see against Western Michigan. Uh, the receivers, the routes were a little bit better. Um, you know, the when you look at the, the right tackle spot, uh, John Bush, Beatty, and and James Hudson when they came in there, they were finishing their blocks a little bit stronger. Getting the second level, you're talking about technical things. Getting the second level, combo block in the second level, I thought was better. I thought their pulls were a little bit better, and their pass protection. Uh, you know, they were right they're, when they're taking their step back. I didn't see them taking that misstep, right? that step inside when they're supposed to be outside. So those are all positives. Again, I mean the caliber that they went up against is not quite no game but in terms of at least like seeing them play with the technique that you want to see them i was encouraged by what i saw on saturday so going back again to the film when you look forward to this game against smu where's the what's the growth where are the growth areas you're like okay we saw some growth here last week this is now again against an undermanned opponent and you know it's weird with smu they kind of have a gambling offense and a gambling defense they have 14 tackles for loss already this season but they've given up 40 points to both of their first two opponents in tcu uh and uh and, and also north texas so when when you start looking ahead to this week's game, Michael, where are the areas you're like, okay, now is where this next stage of evolution, this is what we want to see when we look at next week's film, I want to be talking about what? When I look at next week's film, I want to be seeing how they do, how the offensive tackles and offensive line performs when these guys are in the pocket. Uh, They still allowed three quarterback pressures and a sack um, on 13 pocket possessions for the quarterback. That's too high, uh, if you ask me, um, especially against a, a team like Western Michigan. So I want to see that cleaned up. Uh, I want to see I, I want to see drop passes go away. Uh, Grant Perry had a drop pass. Oliver Martin had a, had a drop pass. Uh, the tight ends weren't really active in the passing game this week, uh, so I want to see that. Um, along the defense, honestly, I just want to see better plays on the ball in the air. Uh, you have Brandon Watson drop an interception. I think we've had dropped Le- three interceptions already this year, if my count is yeah, right. You yeah, you had Robert Hill drop an interception. Uh, now it's a tough play, but it goes off his hands. So I want to see those guys uh, be better with the ball. And, and Danny, you were at uh, Jim Harbaugh's press conference on Monday. One of the things he talked a lot about was he talked about the two back of offensive tackles, James Hudson and Jalen Mayfield. I'm curious will we see more of those guys integrated into the offense earlier as opposed to just like throwing them in there in the fourth quarter uh, when it's second string time. Well, James Hudson, Hudson, I know for sure, actually got in with the first stringers. Um, I saw him with there in, in there with Shay, and I was expecting him just to go in the fourth quarter, and I go back and look at all my film, and he was actually um, with the first string. So James Hudson, he's a Toledo kid. I'm in the Toledo market. They love James Hudson, um, and he switched from uh, defensive end to offensive line. So him and Mayfield, Harbaugh cannot say enough about yesterday, and he's really excited about their ceiling going forward. So yeah, I think you should totally expect them to be in there with the first stringers more. I would love to see that. That'd be my big thing because. When you're playing when you're getting 10 snaps in the fourth quarter and you know that for the most part you're lined up against western michigan second string you know if you're dominating them that's a good sign but if mm-hmm. you can go in and play 
you know, 10 snaps against the first string uh, defensive line for SMU and you still look good, that gives me hope that if they need to make a change of right tackle down the road here, that James Hudson could be someone that they use uh, in a game situation like that. I wonder, you know, because that seems like the right analysis from our side of the vantage point. But when you look from the coaching standpoint, you know, something I've, I've heard Ed Warner say in the past is sometimes the best offensive lines aren't the five most talented guys, but the five guys that play the best together as one unit. Last year, Michigan started thir- or played 13 different offensive line combinations because of injuries and ineffectiveness. 13 in a 13 game season. That's that's ridiculous. You, you are you you've got no chance of any semblance of cohesion let alone dominance when you have that sort of upheaval up front and that lack of chemistry. And so I wonder if that is one of their major concerns. Uh, because if they put Hudson out there and he's not quite ready yet, it's really hard to go right back to Juwan Bushel Beatty and things of that nature. Because I did listen to some of your show today talking about this, and I listened to some of Harbaugh's comments yesterday. I sort of got the impression he is inviting James Hudson to make this decision for him. That he is inviting James Hudson to go out there and say, I'm not you. You take this job. You leave me no choice but to say you are so much clearly better than Juwan Bushel Beatty. I'm I'm guilty of coaching malfeasance if I don't put you in, because after last year, I think the last thing they want to do is shuffle guys in and out. Don't you guys think? Yeah. Well, be, when the season started after Notre Dame, everyone's asking, why don't you why don't you put some of the young guys in like like James Hudson? Um, who, who cares about experience at this point with the offensive line just not mesh, meshing together? Throw those young guys in. Let's see what they can do. Let's do exactly the opposite of what they did last season with that thir- with those 13 combinations. So, yeah, I think you're totally right. He's inviting James Hudson to take that spot. And for, for James Hudson, yeah, it's a new position for him, switching from defensive line to offensive line. But if he's going to pick up that, that quickly um, – yeah, let's go with the younger guys on the offensive line then. I think it's interesting that after two games here, we're talking not about John Runyon Jr. anymore, mm-hmm. which is incredible because he had a really bad game against Notre Dame, but we're talking about Juwan Bushel Beatty. And the reason we're talking about Juwan Bushel Beatty and James Hudson versus on the other side of the line is John Runyon is still only two games in his starting career, and so you don't really know yet what his ceiling is. When it comes to John Bushel Beatty, he started eight games a year ago. I think he started uh, one or two games in 2016. Uh, now he started two games this year. I think we know what his ceiling is, and that's a ceiling that's not really something that's going to excite uh, the, the fan base or really excite this team. Uh, when you're looking at James Hudson, you go back and watch that fourth quarter in the, in the drive that uh, Dylan McCaffrey led for a touchdown, and he is finishing his blocks, and he is very physical at the point of contact and essentially throwing that guy around. I mean, uh, the the backup defensive end for, for Western Michigan really stood no chance against James Hudson, and that's why, you know, I think when you look at the right side of the line, uh, you want a, a, a road grader on the right side. It's not the blind side of the quarterback. You want someone out there that with Michael and Wenu, who is the biggest lineman on this team, mm-hmm. uh, can really can force, uh, can, can, can push the pile uh, and can be someone that you can run behind. Uh, Bush obeyed that's supposedly his strength, but it's not a great strength. So I think you're more likely to see James Hudson replace Bush obeyed at some point. And I would be, if it's going to happen, to me it's going to happen before October because you're not going to go in and, and make that change uh, when it's Wisconsin and Michigan State. You're going to make that change against Nebraska, against Northwestern. Maybe even this week is a great week of practice. That was pretty clear from listening to Harbaugh yesterday. It's going to come down to practice. He might be... He might perform the game, but if he doesn't perform in practice, they're not gonna the, they're not gonna have the confidence in him to put him out there on Saturday. Yeah, Harbaugh specifically mentioned practice. He wants to see these guys owning it there and not getting tired. Uh, that was a big thing. He doesn't want to see him get tired in practice, or he's not gonna play him in a game. So, um, I guess we won't really know how Hudson is coming along until they invite us to practice. Until they <laughs> like. Good luck with that. Yeah. Team. It's fine. They don't even open them for Danny, and frankly, I, I mean, used to. I used to be able to go to their practices. Well, the other thing too is, and I'll leave. I'll leave you guys with this: if you want to do some some max protect stuff, you can do that to shore up one tackle position. You can't do that with two tackle spots. And clearly the gap between James Hudson and Juwan Bushel Beatty from a re- from a preparation standpoint is much closer than a true freshman in Jalen Mayfield and John Runyon Jr. And so I think that, you know, 
if you got to make a change, that's that's where you can put the younger guy with higher upside there, because you can keep the extra tight end or the extra back end to help you help John Runyon. You can't do that with both of your tackle spots being yeah. sieves, and so I think that that's part of it too. You know, if if there's a play that uh, I'll be breaking now with Devin Gardner, the play action, the the touchdown pass to Nico Collins. What side of the line did they max protect with their tight end and their running back? Do you know? I'm going to guess the Runyon side would be my guess. No. It, it was, was the Beatty? Special Beatty? Okay. And you know what? You can you can say it's about a formation and how they how the defense lines up. Mm-hmm. But they started with the tight end in, in, you know, an offset. And they – and Kron Higdon, when, uh, when that play – the snap took place – his eyes didn't go left and then center and then right to like find where the most uh, you know the, the biggest threat was. He immediately went to the right to help out on the right side of the line. Excellent analysis, Michael Spat, Danny Rogers. Thanks for joining us again this week here on Michigan Podcast. We appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Well, we've been teasing this since we uh, launched season two of Michigan Podcast, and now it's here. Wolverine Digest, part of the Maven Network, launched this week. This is a new endeavor from myself and Michael Spath from WTKA. And and this is really, for those of you that can't get enough of the, the kind of analysis that we do here on Michigan Podcast, this is right up your alley in print, because this is content targeted for the critical thinking fan, meaning you're okay with honest analysis and that honest analysis may not always be when we lose, we're the victims, we was robbed. Uh, You want to know uh, what you need to know about why you saw what you saw in the last game and why the next game might get better or might not. And that's what we're going to bring you each and every day at Wolverine Digest. Now, here's my sneaky favorite part of the website. If you go to the right here where it says conversations, and if you follow like Mike Florio at Pro Football Talk or websites like that, what we're able to do here is throughout the course of the day, like if you just keep our site bookmarked, all day long, and you don't want it. You want to stay away from the social media cesspool out there. Let us navigate it for you, because we are keeping you up to date on the best Michigan-related content and breaking news that happens on a daily basis. And we're able to keep that running. Uh, scroll there, uh, just update that throughout the course of each and every day for you here at Wolverine Digest. So that might be my favorite part of the website is that conversations uh, at thing that you see there on the right side of the front page. So if you if you can't get enough if you love what we do here at michigan podcast when the show is over we just move over to wolverinedigest.com this week's twitter poll results we asked you hey the decade between 2007 and 2017 michigan football averaged 7.6 wins per season how many wins per season will the wolverines average the next decade between 2018 and 2028 and Overwhelmingly, well, not quite overwhelmingly, 48%, almost a majority of you, believe Michigan will average nine wins a season over the course of that decade. I voted with the 39% that picked eight. 13% of you predicted Michigan would average about seven wins a year like it has the previous decade. Boy, we all hope you're wrong, don't we? Yes, we do. This week's question of the week, Matthew Green asks, why no time for Joe Milton on Saturday? Now, for those of you that don't know the name yet, Joe Milton is a quarterback that uh, the coaches uh, and those around the program are very, very high on. I mean, some people are even throwing out Cam Newton comparisons. I don't know. Let Slow your roll, bro. All right. Nonetheless, uh, every physical tool you could want in a quarterback, Joe Milton does appear to have. And now he just needs time for seasoning and development. And with the new redshirt rule, where guys can play in up to four games at any point during the year and and not lose their redshirt, I think a lot of fans are anticipating they're going to get a chance to get a sneak peek at what he brings to the table. And when you're dominating Western Michigan on Saturday, you're kind of thinking, maybe this is the week. But keep this in mind. You know, you still have some new parts here on offense. You're asking a lot of Oliver Martin, who was a redshirt uh, last year, and this is his first football action. Shea Patterson, you know, uh, got his uh, blue uh, or had a knee injury in, in October of last year. He's he's played one college game uh, in the last year, and that was against Notre Dame. 
before last week. You know, so you've got new ta- you got a new uh, you know offensive line with some guys playing some different positions. You've got to make sure guys are ready. There's no preseason in college football, so I had no problem with leaving the starters out there as long as they did against Western Michigan because you need reps, you need chemistry. I do think if we get into Big Ten season, like against a Rutgers, and you have this kind of a result, I think that's the kind of game now where you take the starters out a little bit earlier and you do let some of those uh, freshmen that are going to redshirt play a little bit more. But we're still very early in the year and with no preseason, the guys that you're going to be relying on this year need as many reps as they can get to get ready to hopefully be in a position to finally start winning some of those big games that have eluded us so far in the Harbaugh era. Well, that's going to do it for us today and this week here on Michigan Podcast. I want to thank our friends and partners at Detroit Sports Podcast. Don't forget, you can like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Michigan Podcast. And you can also subscribe to the audio version of this, uh, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. Until next week, leave us a like here on YouTube, please, and go blue.